Hi, this is ET350 Lecture 11. Uh, today we're going to talk about transformers again. Uh, we're going to look at ideal versus non-ideal. Uh, we'll look at this K called a coupling factor and how the mutual inductance is related to K times the square root of the individual self-inductances across a transformer. Uh, then we'll present these ideal transformer uh, equations, um, assuming K equals 1. Uh, we'll look at the dot convention to determine the sign. Uh, we'll look at a gear ratio analogy for these ideal uh, transformer relationships. Uh, and then we'll justify the sign for both the mutual inductance equations and these ideal uh, equations. Um, we'll look at uh, this concept called additive and subtractive uh, hookups for, um, for practical transformers and then concerns and uh, uh, challenges for paralleling multiple transformers. Okay, so let's begin. And so remember what we're dealing with is a transformer with coils on one side, coils on the other, right? And we had our equations like V1 equals L1 di1 dt, M di2 dt, and then V2 equals L2 di2 dt, and M di1 dt. So let's not forget our picture here. So we have V1, V2, I1, I2. Uh, sorry, I1 and I2. And uh, these are plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus, all dependent on the dot convention. Okay. Now this term M we showed last time is equal to mu N1 N2 A over L. And this assumes no flux leakage under ideal conditions. And in fact, um, we have another relationship, M equals the square root of L1, L2. And like I said here, this assumes K equals one under ideal conditions. And so we actually just, kind of convinced ourselves of that, we can actually take L1 and L2 and then squash, multiply, and square root and just see what we get. So if we multiply, notice we get mu squared, A squared, L squared, and an N1 squared and N2 squared. By square root, we get N1, N2, mu A over L, which is exactly what we showed before. So this relationship holds if your coupling factor is one. Um, now, if your coupling factor is between zero and one, now you have not so ideal situations. So what's an example of a, a non-ideal transformer? Well, here's my cell phone chart. So this is kind of cool. This is actually a transformer right here. You have a coil that has AC current and inside my cell phone, I actually have another coil that's receiving uh, the, the electricity. And so the coupling factor here is probably not great, maybe 0.1 or less. Um, now, as you get closer, it works, but it, once you get farther away, um, it, there's no, no transformer action. It's just too far, right? There's no magnetic uh, permeable material to transfer the flux density. So you got to get this thing really close in order for your phone to charge, okay? So that would be an example of a non-ideal transformer. Even this design here is not going to do too well in terms of transformer action. A better, a better design would be something like this where you have both coils wrapped around the same middle leg here, and then the flux can go around. It has a nice path, okay? So I draw this just because it's simple to draw, uh, but this is a, a much better design to get a higher coupling factor, wrapping both wires on top of each other and creating a nice, a nice path for the magnetic flux, okay? Um, but yes, let's keep moving. Now, if the coupling factor is one though, then we have that nice relationship, and we also have these nice relationships, okay? And this is V2 equals plus or minus N2 over N1 V1, and I2 equals plus or minus N1 over N2 I1, okay? And notice the ratio flips, right? And what is N? N is the number of turns of the first coil, N2 is the number of turns of the second coil. Um, what else do we note? We got the plus or minus, that's gonna be from the dot convention. We'll see how that uh, works later. Um, a way I like to memorize it is I remember the voltage. I remember V2 and N2. If I can remember that, I'm good because I go V2, N2, right? And then the rest is, you know, V1 over N1. And if I remember this one, I remember that the I, the current is the opposite. So if this is N2 on the top, then this is N1 on the top. So, and notice the order. I have the, always the twos. I think of the two as the output and the one as the input. Right, so I think of this as output. So V2 equals N2, that's my memorization. And then I know the pattern over N1, V1. And then I2, which is again an output equals N1 because it flips over N2, I1, 
And the plus or minus, you'll just have to get it from the dot convention. That's how I remember it. Now you have to remember these only work for AC and not DC. If you have a DC system, they don't, you know, there's no uh, Faraday's law, there's no change in flux, there's no, none of that I induce and be opposed, which we will go over later in this lecture. And so if you have DC current on the primary, you're going to get zero, no current on the secondary. You have to have this oscillating AC in order to induce AC on the other side. Okay. Okay, so what I did want to do is, is now that we, you can skip ahead if you, if you want to ignore this, but for this part here, I wanted to show us how do we go from these equations here to these two simple equations under ideal circumstances? It's kind of interesting, right? It's like, really, this kind of mess of equations with V1s and DIs and DIs and V2s to this nice kind of separate? And yes, that actually happens when K equals 1. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just take a positive case. So just assume all these are positive. And so I have V1 equals L1 DI1 DT plus m, which under ideal conditions is just the square root of L1, L2 times di2 dt. And we're going to do the same thing here. Notice the mutual inductance is the same for both. And I want to see, can I reduce this down, play some algebra tricks, and get down to this? And the answer is yes. So let's just do the v first. So under the v, I could look at the first equation here and I could, well, um, what do I have? I could solve for this di1 dt. So what do I have? I have v minus this guy, yep, divided by L1, and then plug it in here. And now I have equation v2 with v1 in it. So I have a v2 with v1 in it. And the question is, can I go from this guy here to this guy here with enough cancellation? Well, if we crunch, what do we notice? We have um, this guy comes out and this guy comes out. This just drops down and I have an L1, L2 square root times an L1, L2 square root, which is just L1, L2 without the square root. Um, I notice the L1s cancel. And so I'm just left with an L2 di2 dt with a negative and an L2 di2 dt with a negative. This whole thing falls out. Wow, that's kind of nice. Then if we keep going, remember our definitions for L1 and L2. It's just mu n1 squared over L, mu n2 a squared over L. And let's just see how that collapses. Okay, notice the n1s now and the n2s now appear, right? So on the top, we have a mu squared, which becomes just a mu. We have an a squared, which it becomes an a when we square root. And we have an l squared, which is becomes an l. And notice we still have n1 and n2. And because the square root cancels the square, we're just left with it by itself. Now we still have the denominator term. And let's look what happens. The a's cancel, the mu's cancel, the l's cancel. And one of the n1's cancels with that square. So we get an n2 over an n1. And we get that nice equation n2 over n1 for this one. Not too bad. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of a hairy kind of algebra mess, but that's kind of nice uh, to show us that, hey, we can start with these more general equations and actually get these nice, this nice simplification. Okay. Um, what, how could we convince ourselves that the current relationship is true? Well, if it's ideal situation, we can assume that the power is conserved. So the power on one side of the transformer equals the power on the other side. Well, what do we know about power? Power is I1, V1, and I2, V2. So that means I1, V1 equals I2, V2 if we have ideal uh, conditions. And so if we have a relationship like this, and we already know this is true, well, the I1, I2 is just the inverse of it. And then you get N1 over N2 as opposed to N2 over N1. Okay, not too bad. Just thought it was a nice thing to show. But um, yeah, more for your curiosity than if you'll ever need this in your career. Okay, now how would you determine the sign, right? So based on the dot convention. So now let's say we have ideal conditions. We have this V2 equals plus or minus N2 over N1 V1. Um, the way you can determine the sign is now you can look at your dots, right? Your dots, whether diagonal or top and top or bottom and bottom, okay? Now, if the V1 and V2 have the same polarity with respect to the dots, for example, the positives are touching the dots or the both negatives are touching the dots, then we will use the positive, okay? For the I, the I case, if both I1 and I2 are entering the dots, we're actually going to use negative. So you, you, to get positive, they have to be kind of opposed, right? Opposite directions in terms of entering or leaving their dots. Okay, so let's just do a bunch of examples here, and I think that'll hit home, uh, that, these rules. 
So if we look at this example, we have, okay, we have our dots. We don't know what the windings are, but it doesn't matter. We have the dots and we look at the dots and we go, okay, in this case, both V1 and V2 are touching their dots in terms of the positive polarity. So that must be V1 and V2 have the positive grade. I1 is entering the dot and I2 is leaving the dot, positive as well, good. Okay, look at, let's look at this one. V1 and V2, both positive touching, that means it's positive, bang. I1 and I2 are entering their dots, that means it's negative, good. Uh, oh, V1 negative, V2 positive is touching, that should be negative for the voltage, good. And let's see, we gotta be careful here. I2 is entering, but I1, if we go through, is actually leaving. So that's an opposite, so that means it's positive, good. And this last one here, what do we have? V1 positive, V2 negative, that means it's negative for the voltage, good. And I1 is entering, and technically, if we follow I2 is also entering, that should be negative, good. Okay, so it's not too bad, just grind a bunch of these problems and you know, the sign's pretty straightforward, just follow the rules, right? Okay. What I like to also think of when I think of these transformers in an electrical sense, I like to also think of our mechanical gear analogies. So imagine you have two gears, right? We all know and love gears. We have some input torque and speed and we have some output torque and speed, let's say N1 and N2. And from the diagram, you can easily see that N2 is a much bigger gear than N1. And I hope you can imagine that this speed on omega one will be bigger than omega two. Okay, right, because we, and then this will just slowly crunch along, right? Okay, and I think you already know that if this speed is big, then the torque is small and this torque is big, right? Because they have that inverse proportional relationship. So you can see that omega two equals N one over N two omega one. So I hope this is something you could always convince yourself of. And let's, let's just double check this makes sense with our intuition. I have an N one small, we have an N2 big, so this is gonna create a small number. And we have omega two, which we know in this case is gonna be small. So small and small in the numerator, yep. And then omega one as the fast input, but the fast input gets canceled out with a big year, and then we're left with a small number. That should make sense, okay? Now for the torque, it just flips, right? So that's one way I like to re-derive the gear ratio uh, relationships for myself. If I forget, it's like, is omega two, is it N1 over N2, is it N2 over N1? I kind of go through this little process to, to re-familiarize myself, especially if I'm not using this every day. Okay. Now notice omega is like a velocity and current is also like a velocity. It's like a flow of charge, if you recall. Remember torque is like a force or a pressure and we have voltage like a force or a pressure. And so if you look at this, look at this, I2 equals N1 over N2 uh, uh, I1, right? Notice the similarity in their relationships. And then same with the pressure. Pressure or force two equals N2 over N1. Notice the same ratio. So maybe that's another way to remember um, these relationships, right? If you remember one, then you can remember the other, right? If you remember V2 equals N2 over N1 V1, then the torque is gonna be the same exact relationship. And then the current, if you remember the voltage is N2 over N1, the current is N1 over N2, and the speed is N1 over N2. So, you know, if it helps, it helps. If it doesn't, no worries. But um, I always like to relate these electrical concepts to tangible mechanical concepts, because I don't know, I think we have more intuition with mechanical things. Okay, here's what I'd like to do. I'd actually like to justify um, the signs for both these mutual inductance equations with our dot convention and our ideal transformer relationships with our dot convention. And I want to justify it based on our Faraday's law principles, right? With the whole B opposed and the, you know, I induced and all that stuff. And the reason I want to do that is just, I just want to lock in the fact that those seven fundamentals really come into play with all this electrical stuff and it doesn't stop at transformers. Really nice. Okay, so let's have an example situation here where we have V1, I1, V2, I2, we have two dots. Let's make sure our dots are set up correctly. So ignore V1, uh, V1, I1, ignore I2, V2. If we look at the dots and we had test currents going to the dots, it looks like the flux would go up. And if I put a test current into the dot, it looks like the flux would go down. Yep, they're all in the same direction. So it looks like this, whoever set up these dots did a good job. Yes, whoever set it up. 
Good job. Okay, now we have uh, our rules to determine the signs, right? So if we have this, these general equations, we have I2 leaving the dot, and we have V1 positive touching the dot. So that looks like it's gonna be a negative, good. And we have I1 entering the dot and V2 positive touching the dot it looks like it's gonna be a positive. So what does that mean? That means if we get a negative DI1, like a decreasing DI2 DT, then we'll get a positive voltage induced, right? And vice versa, if we get a positive increasing DI1 DT, we will get a positive voltage induced, okay? But what I wanna do is go through a, a scenario where we can convince ourselves that this I2, if it has a negative uh, rate, it will create a positive voltage, right? Is this true? And let's go through our Faraday's law, Ampere's law approach. Okay, so let's walk through this. Let's look at the right side. Let's say I2 is going this way and I2 is increasing, right? So let's say it's increasing in the positive direction, right? So that means this number here is getting bigger. Are we gonna get a negative number on the V1 as if this was a measurement over here? If we had a black lead and a red lead, would we see a negative number? Let's double check that. So I1 is increasing. So let's say I, or sorry, I2. So let's say I2 is just static. We're gonna create a flux two via Ampere's law going up. Now, if it's increasing, this flux is gonna increase. And what does Faraday's law, Lenz's law say? We don't like that. We are gonna create a flux opposed in the opposite direction, okay? And here's our conductor. So Ampere's law would state to support that flux opposed, we're gonna induce current in this direction in order to support that V opposed, which means positive charge is gonna build up down here, which means we're gonna get a measure, a negative number. Yes, that is supported. That's very good. And I just wrote down and, and state, uh, wrote down what I just stated, okay? Okay, we can do the same thing for the other side. So we can look at I1 here and look at the change in I1 and see if we get uh, the right sign for V2. So this is saying if we get a positive DI1 DT, we're gonna induce a positive voltage and let's check that out. So let's start on the left side. I1 goes into the terminal by uh, Ampere's law, we have a flux going up, great. If this were to increase in current, this would increase by Ampere's law and we would have a phi opposed. Good. To support that phi opposed by Ampere's law again, we would be in this direction and you could see a positive charge would build up at this positive terminal. Therefore, V2 would see a positive number. Excellent, we're getting consistency, right? And so we would write here, Ampere's law, this is increasing and this is increasing. Good. Okay, I, I hope that convinces you that uh, Faraday's law, Ampere's law is consistent with um, our dot convention rules for finding these mutual inductance signs. Okay, let's do the same thing for the ideal transformer, right? We have these new equations here. Okay, we have the exact same setup as before. Um, let's just confirm that. So I have this, right? Look at, if we have the coils, I1, good, good, V2, good, good. So the, we know the dots are set up correctly, right? And if we follow our, again, our dot convention, but now for the ideal transformer, what do we have? Both positives are touching the dot, so we have a positive, and I1 go, goes in and I2 leaves, so we also have a positive, okay? All right, so this should be our equations and these should be our signs, but again, let's do the same thing and let's see if the, uh, if the Faraday's law, Ampere's law analysis gives us that same kind of behavior, right? So let's look at the voltage. So let's say we have the voltage. If, we, if now V1 is the input and we have some kind of, imagine now V1 is like a source and V2 is a measurement, right? And let's say V1 were to increase in voltage as if it's a source. Well, we would get current to flow in here, right? If this is a source, positive charge is gonna in, have current leave, right? Now by Ampere's law, this current's gonna create a flux going like this, good. And this is increasing. So V1 increases, a current going into here would increase, which means a flux would increase. We would get a phi opposed to fight that by Faraday's law, Lenz's law, and to support that, I induce would, would be in this direction, swirling around, and we'd build positive charge at V2. Yes, we get a positive, uh, consistent result here, okay? 
Let's do the same thing for the current, right? So let's do the same thing for the current. So the current in this case is also positive. So let's now do the same thing, I1 to I2. Now let's assume I1 is like a current source, right? And so I have a current source, we're sending current in, I'm increasing the current, right? And so we have a phi one that's increasing by Ampere's law. We have a phi opposed again, induces by, and then Ampere's law supports that phi opposed, has I induced coming this way, bang, look at this. This I induce is in the same direction as I2, therefore I2 is gonna be a positive number. And so again, consistency in our dot convention sign, right? Um, the nice thing about the dot convention is it allows us to ignore all of this, right? You don't wanna be doing this every single time, right? But it is nice to see that the low level physics are supporting these kind of dot convention rules that are much faster. Okay, now maybe a question you might have is, what does it even mean to have a plus or minus? Like who cares, okay? So remember, V and I are AC, they're oscillating back and forth. So let's just look at V1. So imagine V1 is an AC voltage like so, right? Okay, now if you have a positive sign, well, that just means that V2 is in phase, but only scaled in amplitude by the uh, transformer ratio, right? N2 over N1. So it might have a different amplitude, but when this is high, this is high. When this is low, this is low, right? They're in phase. If you have a negative sign, it means it's out of phase by a perfect 180 degrees, right? Which means when this is high, this is low. When this is low, this is high, right? And so that's what it means. You get this flip of phase. And that could be important. Now, other transformers, when we talk about three phase transformers, you might start getting that 30 degree phase shift, not just a 180, but maybe a 30. So there's all sorts of little things that might go, you know, go wrong. And if you're paralleling transformers and if you have this, these polarities really matter. If you just have a single phase transformer and a single phase transformer out, you kind of don't care plus or minus, right? But if you're connecting one transformer with another, let's say, and you don't get your polarities correct, now one transformer output is gonna have a high and the other transformer is gonna have a low, bang, in a bad way. It'll just wreck everything, okay? So that's where it really matters. Okay, now um, just some practical terminology is that on a transformer, you usually have a high side and a, and a low side. Typically the high side, they denote as H1 and H2 and the low side they'll denote as X1 and X2. Okay, and so here's an example, H1, H2, X1, X2, right? Now, usually they put the dots where the X1 and H1 are. You guys see this here? And so in this case, when you have diagonal dots, this is what we call an additive form, and this is called a subtractive form when we have the dots on the same side of the transformer, like physically on the same side. And uh, this subtractive is actually a better way to do things, right? And this is used, for high KVA uh, transform, what is KVA? This is your apparent power, right? This is the parent power, the total power that this transformer uh, can, can handle, right? So either greater than 200 KV or greater than 8,660 8, volts, you definitely want to use subtractive. Now the question is, well, why would anyone use additive then? Well, you know, when they first started building transformers and they got all their machines tooled up, legacy, right? They, they have a bunch of additive. But what we'll see is that you have less voltage stress. So this is actually a better way to do things uh, in terms of uh, 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 voltage stress for a transformer, okay? So here's a way to see why subtractive is better, and it actually relates to the sign that we saw. So imagine you have an additive transformer, and let's say we did a, 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 an interesting scenario where we hooked up a voltmeter, from here to here, and we shorted here to here. Okay, so notice I hooked up a voltmeter to measure between X1 and X2, and I took a wire and I connected X, uh, X2 to H1. Okay, by KVL, we could actually run a KVL loop around here. So we have what? Um, VM minus VS plus VP. So VP is the primary, VS is the secondary. Okay, we could do the same thing for the subtractive. We could have a same exact situation, short, voltmeter, okay? And notice the difference here. Uh, oh, sorry, the KVL is the same, VM minus VS plus VP. So same KVLs for both, but this is subtractive and this is additive, okay? So one's gonna have a positive, one's gonna have a negative sign. 
In the additive case, let's look at what happens. VP will be doing this, and VS will be the 180 degrees out of phase, okay? In the subtractive, VP and VS are gonna be in phase. Notice both positives are touching the dot, so they're gonna be positive. Look at this, negative touches the dot, positive touches the dot, so they're gonna be, this is gonna have a negative transformer relationship. So here you're out of phase and here you're in phase, just like we talked about right here, okay? Now, let's look at what happens. VM minus VS plus VP equals zero, good. VM minus VS plus VP equals zero, good. So we have the same KVL. VM here is gonna be VS minus VP, same with over here, so they have the same KVL, good. Now in this case, look at this, VS minus VP, well, if we go to this biggest differential, could be as much as 15 volts, right? Now over here, look at this, the biggest differential here, the biggest is gonna be five volts. And you can definitely see 15 is greater than five. So at any given moment, you can see that this additive could experience a much higher voltage differential across the transformer terminals. That's what this voltage meter is measuring, right? Okay, now they're both doing, they, if you have the same N2 over N1 ratio, they're both doing the same job. They're both doing the same transformer re, uh, relationship. In this case, I don't know, two, uh, two to one, right? But the uh, coil to coil voltage difference is gonna be much higher in the additive, right? So this coil at certain points is gonna see much more voltage on, than this side at certain points in the frequency, right? So that way uh, it would be better to go to subtractive because there's less voltage stress. And why is less voltage stress good? Well, think of the insulators, right? The insulators have a, a, an easier time keeping all the voltage inside the, the wires, right? And so they're less likely to break down. So this is a much better way, especially when, if we're in the kilovolt kind of range, okay? So just an idea, um, you probably won't have to deal with it. Probably the subtractive will be spec'd out already for you, but it's just something to note. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is paralleling transformers. And the question is, why would I want multiple transformers, right? Like, let's say um, I wanted, you know, a, a ratio of two to one or 10 to one, whatever, it doesn't matter. And I have my primary coming in, but then I would have a primary here and then a second transformer and two secondaries coming out, right? But then they would be attached in parallel to each other. Well, there's like some good reason, right? Is because now each transformer doesn't have to take all the current, right? So you're sharing load, okay? Um, maybe it's cheaper to buy two, uh, two half-powered transformers than one larger one, right? Uh, could you expand in the future? Yeah, you could just add a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one, right? Um, if one goes down, you can either maintain or replace it easily and still have power going to your system. And let's say you want to uh, improve your efficiency and maybe you're not transferring as much power. Well, maybe you just take one out so that way you're not having to flip all the magnetic poles and domains and deal with all the hysteresis any currents from one of the trans having all the transformers on so there's a lot of good reasons to having parallel equipment smaller parallel equipment okay now what do you have to do if you're going to do something like this you got to get the polarity right if you don't get the player we talked about that if you don't get that polarity right where that dot convention matters you could be uh, having positive when the other one is negative Right? You also got to get those turns ratios matched up right. Because if you have N2 over N1 as 10 to 1, the other one is 11 to 1, now you're having these mismatches in voltage and you're getting current circulating into each other. And a worst case, you have it completely off or backwards. Now um, that could be catastrophic, right? Now the other one is kind of interesting. This is, a, this is a subtle but very, very important idea. You want to make the impedance. Remember, impedance is resistance to... Uh, uh, AC current, right? You want it proportional to one over the power rating. You're like, well, that's kind of weird, right? And so why would you want that? Well, you want a, a transformer, if it can't handle the, the power, so if it's a lower power, um, if you have a lower power transformer, so you have two transformers, one's low powered, one's high powered, they have the same turns ratio. You want the low powered one to have a higher Z, so more current goes to the higher power transformer, 
if that makes sense. Think of uh, equivalent resistances, right? So if you have two resistors, imagine these resistors are like transformers. And uh, what happens if you have a little baby R and you have a little bit a big R, all the current is going to want to go to here. Well, if all your current is going to here, here you want a big power rating and maybe a little power rating, right? Because if you have all the current going here, this has to dump a lot more power, okay? So the same idea with paralleling transformers. You want to have this nice inverse relationship to Z or R and power so that you don't break your small low power transformer, right? Anyway, I hope, I hope this lecture helped you. I hope it built some intuition and uh, I look forward to seeing you in class. Have a great day.